Chapter 12 In the beginning was Adam. Stories of Creation and Birth The first five chapters of Genesis are scarcely a preface to the events that actually took place during the first thousand years of this earth's existence. They are probably the most incomplete and mysterious chapters of the Bible. Vast amounts of historical knowledge have been lost pertaining to the creation and beginning years of man and his surroundings on this earthly sphere. The great men who lived during that time walked and talked with God, and they knew many secrets of life, many untold secrets of the universe. They must have been near to immortality, because we read that Enoch walked with God, Genesis 5 verse 24, and Noah walked with God, Genesis 6 verse 9. They knew the secret of long mortal lives, for during that period of time men lived to be nearly a thousand years old. Seth lived to be 912, Enos was 905, Kainan, 910, Mahalalil, 830, Jared was 962, Methuselah lived 969 years, Lamech, only 777, and Enoch fell behind with a mere 365 years of age. It is interesting to imagine the tremendous knowledge of these godly men regarding the creation of earth and man, whereas now we have only a few clues. A little further light on the creation is available from the New Testament. We read there a different story of Adam's creation, for it says he was the Son of God, Luke 3 verse 38, hardly fitting the description of a man who was made like a mud ball. Either the story of an adobe man creation is symbolic, or Luke, a disciple of Christ, didn't know what he was talking about. However, it stands to reason that Adam had a father. Furthermore, the fall was planned before the creation, and Christ would make an atonement for that fall. The scriptures say that Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13 verse 8, therefore, his atonement was planned and instituted before the fall of man. This fall and redemption hinged upon the work of both Adam and Christ. Only through the light of revelation can the mysteries of the ages be recovered. The suppositions, philosophical meanderings, and man-made doctrines presented by overenthusiastic ministers today leave us more confused and in the dark than ever. But regarding the Genesis account of creation, we need to keep in mind the type of people and conditions existing at the time Moses wrote this early portion of the Old Testament. The children of Israel were then ignorant and idolatrous and certainly not ready for the pearls of the real gospel. These people were hardly capable of thinking for themselves, so Moses could give them only an abbreviated and symbolic story of the creation. This is somewhat the same as when Christian parents tell their children that a stork brought them, satisfying them for the present. For many centuries, the children of Israel had been slaves in Egypt. Their religion had been reduced to the same level as that of the Egyptians, worshipping statues and cows. It was a primitive religion, yet it still persists in India to this day. As ignorant as they were, Moses tried to give them something they could understand that would elevate their thinking about the true God. He began with the creation, and wrote Genesis in hopes they would turn from idolatry because of this new understanding of their relationship with the Creator. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs, and closed up the flesh instead thereof, and the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. Genesis 2 verses 7 and 21, 22. The children of Israel could read this story literally or figuratively. Today, men do the same, but whatever interpretation is put on this account, the following must be concluded. 1. God was the creator of mankind. 2. God created man and woman in his own image. 3. We are the children of God, our Father in heaven. This story of creation, if given a literal interpretation, does not make any sense. Yet most of today's Christians have regressed back to the same pagan understanding of the children of Israel when they still felt the influence of the Egyptians. Today, many Christian schoolbooks teach that man was first dust of the earth, then he began to evolve into living cells that added other cells until he began to swim, then creep and crawl upon land, and finally he became a full-grown man. Darwin, who is mentioned in these textbooks, accepts the dirt man, but not the rib woman. 
but most of our Christian ministers believe in Adam and Eve as Mr. Adobe and Miss Rib. According to the biblical account, the first kind of reproduction was a woman being created from the rib of a man. See Genesis 2 verse 22. But is this really a true story? Can human beings be reproduced from a rib? Were there any other humans created by taking the rib out of a man and making a woman? If this story is literally true, then we should be able to do it again, especially in light of all the knowledge that science now possesses. But if you should tell the medical profession that a woman could be created, out of a rib, they would laugh and tell you that men do not give birth to women, especially from one of their ribs. Thus, this story must be taken figuratively. Continuing on in history, we have the mysterious story of how Jesus was born. Through various scriptural translations and interpretations, we are told that Jesus was begotten by the Holy Ghost. This also is a very unsexual type of reproduction, and is a very dangerous type of begetting, because any woman who receives the Holy Ghost could become pregnant. If it happened once, why couldn't it happen again? Has it ever occurred before or since? Again, we must conclude that this story is also figurative. Here, then, are three different types of reproduction as recorded in the Bible. 1. A man formed out of the dirt like a mud pie. 2. A woman born from a man's rib. And, 3. Jesus sired by the Holy Ghost. Added to these is the story of Melchizedek who was, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, nor end of life. Hebrews 7 verse 3. If we accept the modern minister's interpretation of that scripture, are we to believe that this man was never born and will never die? Or is this a figurative account referring to the man's priesthood? The interpretation of these passages by modern ministers only adds to the confusion. We must look to true modern prophets for a proper interpretation and understanding. Testimony of a Witness The Apostle Paul said there would be a restitution of all things, Acts 3 verse 21. In other words, ancient mysteries and important knowledge would again be restored. Such pertinent information could be revealed from heaven only to a prophet, since no one else would comprehend it. Mankind have been wandering in a spiritual darkness for many centuries, believing in such superstitions as God is like the wind, invisible, and without any image, etc. It was necessary for God to again reveal his identity to someone who could be a witness for him. By revealing the true identity of God, it would of course expose the fictitious stories and erroneous theories of the sectarian ministers who feared this would cut deeply in their merchandising of the God business and endanger their craft. Naturally they resented this new gospel and attempted to discredit or destroy it. Even new information in the field of science has initially brought fear and persecution. Discoveries such as gravity, the earth being round, the radio, telephone, microwave, and atomic power have all had opponents who feared them, claiming that man was tampering with mysteries of God. We can well imagine the turmoil of a prophet who was actually revealing new mysteries about God. Such, however, was the obligation of Joseph Smith. The prophet Joseph was faced with the dilemma of what part of these mysteries about God he could reveal. Some should be withheld because he was forbidden to reveal them or because too many people would reject them. To a few thinking and select people, he did reveal a little more than he did to others. One of these mysteries was information about the first couple who lived in the Garden of Eden. From the book of Genesis we learn that Adam was with his father in heaven before he came into this world, and he was an immortal being. It was not until he partook of the fruit of the tree of good and evil, that mortality and death affected him. Upon this premise rests a key to a great mystery about God and the creation. The prophet gives us a little additional light from the scriptures by saying, Commencing with Adam, who was the first man, who is spoken of in Daniel as being the Ancient of Days, or in other words, the first and oldest of all, the great, grand progenitor of whom it is said in another place he is Michael, because he was the first and father of all, not only by progeny, but the first to hold the spiritual blessings. TPJS, page 167. Since Michael came from the heavens and became Adam, then we should look a little further into the identity of Michael. It was Michael who fell to become an Adam, and Adam's mission or calling was to become earthly, or of the earth. In other words, Michael was immortal, but became Adam or a mortal being. 
The prophet Daniel speaks of the last days, and at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, Dan 12, 1. Jude speaks of Michael the archangel, Jude 9, who contended with the devil. And John the Revelator said that there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. Revelation 12 verses 7-8 According to these testimonies, it is Michael who is the great prince and the archangel who kicked the devil out of heaven. Daniel continues. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, the judgment was set, and the books were opened. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I saw in the night visions, and, behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Dan 7, 9-10, 13. The prophet Joseph Smith explains that Adam, Michael, is that Ancient of Days. Daniel in his seventh chapter speaks of the Ancient of Days, he means the oldest man, our father Adam, Michael, he will call his children together and hold a council with them to prepare them for the coming of the Son of Man. He, Adam, is the father of the human family, and presides over the spirits of all men, and all that have had the keys must stand before him in this grand council. This may take place before some of us leave this stage of action. The Son of Man stands before him, and there is given him glory and dominion. Adam delivers up his stewardship to Christ, that which was delivered to him as holding the keys of the universe, but retains his standing as head of the human family. DHC 3, 386-87 One of the most enlightening discourses on the exalted position of Father Adam is given by the Prophet Joseph Smith. To whom, Adam, was made known the plan of ordinances for the salvation of his posterity unto the end, and to whom Christ was first revealed, and through whom Christ has been revealed from heaven, and will continue to be revealed from henceforth. Adam holds the keys of the dispensation of the fullness of times, i.e., the dispensation of all the times have been and will be revealed through him from the beginning to Christ, and from Christ to, the end of the dispensations that are to be revealed. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, and which are on earth, even in him. Ephesians 1 verses 9 to 10, asterisk asterisk asterisk. He, God, set the ordinances to be the same forever and ever, and set Adam to watch over them, to reveal them from heaven to man, or to send angels to reveal them. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. These angels are under the direction of Michael or Adam, who acts under the direction of the Lord. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. This, then, is the nature of the priesthood, every man holding the presidency of his dispensation and one man holding the presidency of them all, even Adam, and Adam receiving his presidency and authority from the Lord, but cannot receive a fullness until Christ shall present the kingdom to the Father, which shall be at the end of the last dispensation. TPJS, pp. 167-169 to In summary then, this preceding discourse by the prophet, gives us the following important information on Adam. 1. He is Michael. 2. He is the Ancient of Days. 3. He is the Great, Grand Progenitor. 4. He is the first to hold the spiritual blessings. 5. He knew ordinances for salvation. 6. It was he to whom Christ was first revealed. 7. It was he through whom Christ has been revealed and will continue to be revealed. 8. He holds the keys of the dispensation of the fullness of times, as well as all dispensations. 9. He holds the presidency of all dispensations. 10. He is to watch over the ordinances, to reveal them from heaven to man, or send angels to reveal them. 11. Angels are under his direction. 12. He is the father of the human family. 13. He presides over the spirits of all men. 14. 
all must stand before him, including the Son of Man. 15. Christ is given glory and dominion from him. 16. He holds the keys of the universe. 17. He gives keys of the universe to Christ, but retains being head of the human family. With this information added to what is available in the scriptures, a much clearer picture is painted on the exalted position of our father Adam. Clarification of Problem Areas In the story of creation, there are a few passages of scripture that seem to baffle modern Christianity. Nine of these problem areas are presented in this section, with a brief explanatory paragraph following each passage. 1. And God said, Let us make man in our image, and our likeness, male and female created he them. Genesis 1 verses 26 and 27. Whether God here is speaking to his wife or to other gods, it is evident that there is more than one God. Joseph Smith reveals that there are many gods, and that the term Elohim refers to a council of gods. 2. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, Genesis 2 verses 4-5. This passage indicates that these generations of the heavens and of the earth were created before they were in the earth and grew upon it. The doctrines of pre-existence and spiritual creation were supported and explained by the prophet Joseph Smith. 3. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. Genesis 2 verse 18 So God provided a woman for him, pronouncing them one flesh, and said they should cleave to each other. All this occurred before the fall, before there was any death. Marriage was instigated in heaven, with the approval of God, and was intended to last forever. 4. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. Genesis 3 verse 5 there is little doubt that God was offering man a chance to have his eyes opened, his understanding enlightened and to become as the gods. This is the doctrine taught by the prophet Joseph, that it is possible for man to grow in wisdom and power until he becomes as God. 5. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Genesis 3 verse 8. Before his sad experience in the orchard, Adam talked to the Lord God face to face. So, Adam walked and talked with the Lord God before and after the fall. This makes him more than an ordinary man. 6. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Genesis 3 verse 16. This inference means that Eve had previously experienced joy in childbirth, but after the fall she would have pain and sorrow instead. 7. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Genesis 3 verse 20. This is a correct statement even when taken literally, because indeed, she was the mother of all living. All of her children had been born to her spiritually before this time, as she was the mother of mankind in the pre-existence. 8. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. Genesis 3 verse 22. Adam had already gained so much from his immortal and mortal experiences that he was considered as one of the gods. 9. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. Genesis 5 verse 2. In the days of their creation, mankind was called after the name of Adam. This is no different from children born of a father in this world when he takes his father's name. Mankind took the name of Adam in the day when they were created, in other words, before the fall. Thus, Adam was the literal father of all mankind, before they were born on earth. Other Ancient and Contemporary Evidences The exalted position of Adam can be supported from many other ancient and contemporary records. Consider evidence from such sources as the Egyptians, Apostolic Fathers, Apocrypha, Dead Sea Scrolls, the Jewish, the Quran, New Testament, and a prominent contemporary scholar, Adam Clark. Egyptian Histories Egypt is a land shrouded in mystery and history. It is one of the oldest empires in the world, and therefore plays a unique role in the story of man. It is rich in stories from the Bible with the travels of Abraham, Joseph, who was sold into Egypt, and Moses, who led the children of Israel out of Egypt. 
But long before those episodes, Egypt's history included men of learning and wisdom and even prophets of God. However, as time passed, so increased the influence of error, sin, and rejection of their prophets. Nevertheless, out of their changing history emerge fragments of truth, which help support biblical accounts and teachings, and even include pertinent information about Adam. Praise to Amen R.A., Adam, the good God beloved, the ancient of heavens, the oldest of earth, Lord of eternity, maker everlasting. He is the causer of pleasure and light, maker of grass for the cattle and of fruitful trees for man, causing the fish to live in the river and the birds to fill the air, lying awake when all men sleep to seek out the good of his creatures. We worship thy spirit who alone hast made us, we, whom thou hast made, thank thee that thou hast given us birth, we give thee praises for thy mercy to us. Amen R.A., the Father of the Gods, the Son God, the Bibles and Beliefs of Mankind, pages 14, 16b. The Apostolic Fathers. And the great, glorious angel is Michael, who has authority over this people and guides them, for it is he who puts the law into the hearts of those who believe. So he observes those to whom he has given the law, to see whether they have kept it. The Shepherd of, Hermas, Parable 8, Chapter 3, Verse 3, The Apostolic Fathers, Goodspeed Translation, Page 165. The Apocrypha. Shem and Seth were glorified among men, and above every living thing in creation is Adam. Apocrypha, Ecclesiasticus 49, colon 16, Revised Version. The Dead Sea Scrolls. Today is his appointed time to lay low and make to fall the prince of the dominion of wickedness, and he will send eternal help to the lot he has redeemed by the power of the angel he has made glorious for rule, Michael, in eternal light, to give light and joy to all Israel, peace and blessing to the lot of God. To exalt among the gods the rule of Michael and the dominion of Israel over all flesh. The War of the Sons of Light, 14, the 17th, 5 8, The Dead Sea Scrolls, Burroughs, page 399. Jewish Records The Jewish people have had a reputation for keeping records and histories over a great length of time. They are considered an excellent source for valuable information. The Jewish Encyclopedia, in reference to Adam, gives a quotation from a Slavonic book of Enoch 30, 11. This record says that Adam was like one of the angels. This is a key to the realization that Adam was above the mortals in his spiritual plane. Anyone like the angels would probably be an immortal being. From another record, in speaking of Adam, his body reached from earth to heaven before sin caused him to sink, Hag 12a, San 38b. This probably has inference to Adam traveling between earth and heaven before his fall. If so, then Adam was acting as a god who would make frequent visits to the earth that he had created. It would be necessary for him to bring seeds, fowl, fish and animals to this earth in preparation for mankind. In the non-canonical Jewish writings, significant developments took place in the interpretation of the character and significance of Adam. He was given a glory which transcended that of every other human being. In 2 Enoch 30, 8 ff, it describes him as honorable, great, and glorious. He, Adam, was of extreme beauty and sun-like brightness, BB 58a, and his skin was a bright garment, shining like his nails, when he sinned this brightness vanished, and he appeared naked, Targ. Year. Genesis 3 verse 7. To have sun-like brightness and a skin like a bright garment is the same appearance that Daniel gave to Michael. In another traditional Jewish history, or Midrashic legend, it records that the angels were so filled with wonder and awe at the sight of Adam, the image of God, that they wanted to pay homage to him and cry holy. General R.8, this quotation is saying that Adam was the image of God, and that they all spoke of him as holy. These are descriptions given to God. It would not be fitting for the angels to give such reverence to a mortal. From another Jewish source, it is written that all other creatures, marveling at Adam's greatness, prostrated themselves before him, taking him to be their creator. Perk RL 11, the act of prostrating before someone is an indication of some sublime or heavenly host, a deity or near to it. However, in this instance, Adam was considered to be their creator. No wonder they bowed before him to pay tribute and honor. These were heavenly hosts, not likely to be deceived. 
In still another record it is written that all bowed before Adam except Satan, who, in punishment for his rebelliousness, was hurled from his heavenly heights, and all creation bowed before him in awe. He was their light of the world. Yer. Shah H.5b, if all bowed before Adam except Satan, that means there were no others to bow or to bow to. So because Satan refused to bow before Adam, he was cast out of heaven. Again, if Adam was the light of the world, he would have to be God, for that is a common title given to God. And continuing from the above record, Adam sits at the gates, watching with tears the multitude of souls passing through the wide gate to meet their punishment, and with joy the few entering the narrow gate to receive their reward. Adam stands at the gate of heaven. He must be the one holding the keys of the universe and heaven's gate, as the prophet Joseph Smith said. And then it was written that his body, made an object of worship by some semi-pagan Melchizedek sect, according to the Christian Book of Adam. BB 58a, the Melchizedek sect probably stemmed from the great high priest Melchizedek, who officiated in Jerusalem during the days of Abraham and from whom Abraham received the priesthood. If Adam was the object of their worship, then it meant that he was their god. This idea could have been taught by Melchizedek and taught to Abraham, who walked and talked with God. Eve always addressed Adam as Lord and is not apparently not intelligible, until compared with the Vita and Slavonic Book of Adam, both of which contain similar statements. The Jewish Encyclopedia, Volume 1, 180 Michael, had gathered the dust for Adam's creation. Midr. Conan, in B.H. 2. 27. After the death of Adam, his soul was handed over to Michael. Hag, 12b. The Quran. Even from the Quran it is written that the angels adored him, Adam, save only Iblis, who refused and was too proud, and became one of the misbelievers. Surah 2.29-32, they also say that the soul of Adam had been created thousands of years previously. The New Testament. It is possible that some dim reflection of this, dominion over everything given to Adam, is to be found in a Sumerian literary text which describes how the god Enki set the world in order, and among other things put the animals under the control of two minor deities. Tyndall Bible Dictionary, page 14, the Sumerian library contains this doctrine that two deities held dominion over the earth. Adam and Eve, being the two holding that dominion, must of necessity be those deities. Luke 3 verse 38 refers to Adam as the Son of God, a phrase that he has already used of Jesus, 135. This would be a positive use of the story of Adam, Christ is likened to Adam before his fall, and Adam is a type of the one who was to come. Tyndall Bible Dictionary, page 15, the position of Adam as a son of God and Jesus also a son of God would place them both into a divine order that does not adapt to any other mortals. If Adam descended from his immortal state to become mortal, and Christ stepped from that heavenly place to take upon him mortality, then they both had similar steps in their role on earth. From another source we read, Paul declared that Adam was a type of Christ, the figure of him that was to come, Romans 5 verse 14, hence, our Lord is sometimes called the second Adam. This typical relation stands sometimes in likeness, sometimes in contrast. In likeness, Adam was formed immediately by God, as was the human nature of Christ, in each the nature was holy, both were invested with dominion over the earth and its creatures, CPS 8. In contrast, Adam and Christ were each a federal head to the whole race of mankind, but the one was the fountain of sin and death, the other of righteousness and life. Romans 5 verses 14-19, Adam communicated a living soul to all his posterity, Christ is a quickening spirit to restore life and immortality to them, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45, Unger's Dictionary of the Bible, page 20, I caught. 1545 states, The first man Adam was made a living soul the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Paul, the Apostle, also calls Christ the second Adam. In other words, there was some kind of affiliation between Christ and Adam, more so than any other prophet or patriarch. Both had their dominion over the earth, both had their mission, the fall and redemption, assigned to them before the creation, both had a divinity or perfection. Strange that Paul would assign Adam first and Christ second in their spiritual assignments, unless he knew more than he was telling. 
From all of the writings of the ancients we find this similarity, Adam was a heavenly man and then an earthly man. He played two roles for the benefit of mankind. It appears that as a god, he transgressed a law for which Christ would atone. It took the blood of a god to pay the penalty for a god. As Paul says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Romans 5 verse 19 Contemporary scholar, Adam Clark Adam Clark, the renowned biblical scholar, has contributed some vital information regarding Adam. He realized that Adam was living in a state of perfection previous to the fall. He analyzed that. We shall certainly be convinced that our first parents were in a state of sufficient perfection when we consider, 1, that they were endued with a vast capacity to obtain knowledge. 2, that all the means of information were within their reach. 3, that there was no hindrance to the most direct conception of occurring truth. 4, that all the objects of knowledge, whether natural or moral, were ever at hand. 5, that they had the strongest propensity to know, and, 6, the greatest pleasure in knowing. To have God and nature continually open to the view of the soul, and to have a soul capable of viewing both, and fathoming endlessly their unbounded glories and excellences, without hindrance or difficulty, what a state of perfection, what a consummation of bliss, this was undoubtedly the state and condition of our first parents. Clark's Bible Commentary, I, 45 Clark realizes that there is also a problem with the story of creation, if it is supposed to be read literally. It would then sound impossible, unreasonable, and without any meaning. Said he of the two trees in the garden, some very eminent men have contended that the passage should be understood allegorically. Thus, we may conclude that if the very eminent men among scholars agree that one passage should be allegorical, then other similar passages might also be allegorical. In this passage concerning the tree of good and evil, Clark says, how could the acquisition of such a faculty be a sin? His logic is correct, there is no sin in learning about good and evil. It must be predicated on something else, the fall. Another point of Clark's observation is Adam's tremendous knowledge of all the animals. Said he. Adam gave names, but how? From an intimate knowledge of the nature and properties of each creature. Here we see the perfection of his knowledge, for it is well known that the names affixed to the different animals in scripture always express some prominent feature and essential characteristic of the creatures to which they are applied. Had he not possessed an intuitive knowledge of the grand and distinguishing properties of those animals, he never could have given them such names. This one circumstance is a strong proof of the original perfection and excellence of man, while in a state of innocence, nor need we wonder at the account. Adam was the work of an infinitely wise and perfect being, and the effect must resemble the cause that produced it. Clark's Bible Commentary, I, 45 it may here be noted that since Adam was created in circumstances that were in a state of perfection, he himself must have been perfected. Furthermore, since Adam was created by his God, as a son, then Adam would have resembled God in his very image and likeness. That means perfection. One of the verses in early Bible manuscripts has added more complications. It is different from those made in the common translations of the Bible. The present versions read, Behold, the man is become as one of us. Clark explains. On all hands, this text is allowed to be difficult, and the difficulty is increased by our translation, which is opposed to the original Hebrew and the most authentic versions. The Hebrew has haya, which is the third person preterite tense, and signifies was, not is. The Samaritan text, the Samaritan version, the Syriac, and the Septuagint have the same tense. Clark's Bible Commentary, 145. Three important doctrines are testified to in this verse, 1, that there is more than one God. 2, that Adam had become like them. 3, that the older and more correct manuscripts reveal that Adam was one of the gods, knowing good and evil. No wonder Clark and the other scholars say that on all hands this text is allowed to be difficult. It wouldn't fit into their religious philosophy. They cannot concede that man, or fallen Adam, could become, or that he was a god. 
There is no need to continue the exploration of traditional history and references to the high and significant place that Adam had before the fall. It is clear from the Bible that Adam dwelt with his God, or gods, before the fall, in complete glory, perfection and innocence. The Bible tells us that Adam was immortal before the fall, but afterwards he became mortal. He was first in a state of perfection and then fell to imperfection. Previous to the fall, Adam and Eve lived in a state of complete innocence, they were living as man and wife, and they had no evil or troubles to contend with. As immortals, they were living in eternal bliss, without death. This sounds like heaven, and it was.